So if you were here last week, you might remember me telling a story of how I used to make blanket forts in my children's bedrooms. We'd take blankets and spread them all out over their room so they could sleep underneath them. And that one of the good keys or one of the important keys to making a good blanket fort is having a good anchor, is to having something that will hold that blanket so it doesn't fall down, it doesn't sag in the middle of the night. And so we started talking about what anchors our faith. What are those anchors of our faith? And so this week we're going to continue with that same theme. We're going to explore some additional anchors of faith. We're going to pick up where we left off in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We'll spill over a little bit into chapter 12. And if you remember that scripture from last week, you'll remember the author gave us a very succinct definition for faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction. Of things not seen. And so we teased out of that definition one of these first anchors of faith, which is vision. This vision, this ability to see or imagine or visualize something that has yet come to be. But we all know that a good blanket fort needs more than one anchor, and so we're going to continue with this scripture to see what additional anchors can hold our faith. And so as we read our scripture today, or as we will see in our scripture today, that vision must also be paired with belief. Belief that's not only intellectual, but that must be lived out. And so friends, as we turn once again to these words from Hebrews chapter 11, let us open our hearts and minds to hear what anchors our faith. I'm going to give you just a little bit of a warning before I start reading. There are a ton of Old Testament references in this scripture, so just buckle up, okay? Get ready. Hear the word of God. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others, others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not without us be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Now, didn't I tell you there would be a lot of Old Testament references in that scripture? Did you get them all? I'm going to have the ushers pass out some paper for you. We're going to have a little pop quiz and see how many. No, I'm just kidding. We wouldn't do that. The opening section just ticks off again and again all these stories, all these characters from the Old Testament. To be honest, I'm not sure that my Old Testament class in seminary had the same scope of Old Testament stories. There were about 10 verses or so in there. And if I were to try to go through each of those this morning, I'm pretty sure that none of us would make it to lunch before 1 o'clock. And I'm fairly certain that none of y'all signed up for that today, so that's not what we're going to do. 
We're going to see if we can sort of glean something from all these stories collectively. If we were to to work together, if I was to tell you to turn to your neighbor and think of a synonym for faith, a synonym for the word faith, my guess is that probably one of the first ones that would come up would be belief, faith and belief. Those two words can almost be used interchangeably depending on the situation, faith and belief. But if we drill down just a little bit on both of those words, we might find out they're not exactly the same thing, faith and belief. Most often we think of belief, we think of sort of intellectual ideas. Last week I I quoted this theologian towards the end of my sermon, gave us a a long list of doctrines, of concepts, of ideas that were related to Christianity. We're invited to believe in those ideas. Beliefs can also encompass values. We can believe in things like kindness and generosity and forgiveness and mercy. But if we go back and look at that long list of Old Testament stories and characters in our Scripture, we will discover the reason why faith and belief are not quite one in the same. Now, of course, belief is an important element of faith, but it's only half the equation. That which anchors our faith is not only belief, but it's demonstrated belief. Demonstrated belief. It is incongruent to say that we believe in generosity if we don't then practice generosity. To say that we believe in forgiveness and don't practice forgiveness. The Old Testament stories in our scripture are not of of philosophers or theologians who simply held intellectual beliefs. They are stories of those who also had the courage, the determination to match their beliefs with their actions. Those who believed in God's deliverance, in God's rescue, in God's providence, but also those who had the courage to to follow God in those beliefs. Those who had the courage to put one foot in front of the other, walking through the Red Sea, walking around the walls of Jericho, walking into the lion's den. These Old Testament stories remind me of another story. It's an illustration that's been around for for decades, one that I used to use back in my camp days. But it's a story of a tightrope walker, a tightrope walker who was putting on a big show for a crowd. This tightrope walker was amazing. He could go back and forth and walk across. He could not only walk, he could jump and turn around and spin and sit down and dance. All these different things on the tie rope. It was amazing. Every time he would ramp it up, the crowd would cheer louder and louder and louder. He even took a wheelbarrow with him out on that tight rope. And he wheeled it across back and forth. He did tricks with the wheelbarrow as well. And the crowd was going wild. They were going crazy. And so the the tightrope walker walked back to the end and looked down at the crowd and had a microphone up there and said, Now, do you believe that I could put a person in this wheelbarrow and take them across the tightrope? And of course, the crowd cheered. They all said, Yes, yes, we believe that you can do it. But then the tightrope walker asked for volunteers. (laughs) And you might imagine what happened. The crowd went silent. Nobody raised their hand. That which anchors our faith is not simply our belief, it is our demonstrated belief, giving life to those beliefs through our actions. Now, I don't know that we can really blame that crowd for not wanting to climb in that wheelbarrow. I would certainly not want to do that either. Even if I had all the confidence in the world for that tightrope walker, I'm fairly certain that not many of us would volunteer for that job because it would be terrifying to sit in that wheelbarrow, kind of out of control. But if we look back over our scripture, even as we reflect on our experience, on our lives, practicing faith can prove to be pretty scary at times. You may or may not have noticed that there was a shift there about halfway through our scripture, a shift in the nature of the examples that were listed in the Scripture. 
At the beginning, all the Old Testament stories, the characters that the author talks about are stories of triumph, of of victory. But then somewhere around verse 35, 36 or so, the stories start to take a turn. And the faith of these biblical heroes is not defined by success, but by suffering. There are those who are hurting, those who are imprisoned, those who are tortured, even killed in an effort to demonstrate their belief and remain faithful to God. Reading a list like this can make the practice of faith seem pretty terrifying. In fact, I'm not really sure why the author would include it here in this scripture. The the purpose of this letter, remember, the purpose of this scripture was was to encourage the people who who would be reading it, these people who were discouraged, these people who were losing their faith. I'm not really sure why I'm bringing it up, actually. If our purpose is to encourage each other in our faith, it'd be much easier for us all to just accept this idea of faith, this concept of of faith that is nice and bright and shiny, one that's not quite so complex, complicated, nuanced. And in a sermon, a preacher has this ability, has this luxury, sometimes to skip over difficult verses of Scripture if we don't want to get into them. But each of us know that we don't have that same ability. We don't have that same luxury in our lives. There are times when our faith is well anchored. It is feeling strong and secure, and we are confident. While we are walking through Red Seas or walking around the walls of Jericho or or walking into doctor's offices to hear test results or or walking into the bedrooms of our children to have heart-to-heart conversations or maybe walking into the homes of our parents to have heart-to-heart conversations. However, there are also times when our faith seems to come loose from that which anchors it. When we are scared, when we are facing down armies, facing down crowds with stones in their hands, when we're facing down hills that seem too steep to climb, changes in our lives, in our world that seem too difficult to accept, the author of our scripture acknowledges that these complexities exist within a life of faith, that it is not easy perhaps not even for the faint of heart. However, the author also reminds us that one additional anchor of faith exists, and it comes to us when we switch over to chapter 12. He reminds us that even though we are asked to run this race, a difficult race of faith, we are not asked to do so alone. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. And consider Christ so that we may not grow weary or lose heart. Earlier this week, I had the chance to drive out to to Camp Weaver where they were holding Camp Hope. You may have heard that before. We've talked about it here in the congregation. Camp Hope is put on by the Family Justice Center of Guilford County, and it's for children who come from households that have suffered domestic violence, domestic abuse, and trauma. And you all, as a congregation, help support this camp. You all pay for scholarships so that children can go to this camp. And at Vacation Bible School, if you were there, the the, the mission project for Vacation Bible School was to collect all the camp essentials, sunscreen, bug spray, those kinds of things, so that each camper would have what they needed for that week. On my visit out there, we got to, to hear a little bit about these children, what they have experienced in their lives, all they have been forced to overcome, and how this camp gives them a chance, gives them an environment to rebuild a sense of confidence, a sense of self-worth, self-esteem that has been torn down. All of these children have lived through some pretty scary situations, some significant trauma, but on the night we visited, we got to see them be kids. We got to see them be kids. First thing we watched was this impromptu talent show where each cabin had 20 minutes to come up with a dance to a song. 
And I was glad that I was not among them, because I don't think I could do that, come up with a dance to a song. Maybe you all could. We could try that with our last hymn, if you would like to. <laughs> Choreograph a little something. No. But after this talent show, it was wonderful to see the kids dancing and laughing. We went to their closing campfire, and they did a few different things at this campfire. First, no campfire is complete without a few campfire songs, and so that's how they started the evening, and that was fun to watch. And then they reviewed a story that they had heard earlier in the day. Each day, they talked to them about a, a figure, maybe someone who's, who's famous or, or a sports figure, someone who they would know. That particular day, it was, it was Trevor Noah, someone who had overcome significant challenges in his life. And so each day at camp, when they, they share this story of this figure with the campers, they, they do this so that they can talk about, see an example of someone who's endured significant challenges, hardships in life, but someone who persevered to achieve their dreams. And they didn't stop there. Then, then they asked the campers and the counselors to raise their hands, to share examples that they had witnessed throughout the day of their fellow campers who had persevered in the face of difficult circumstances. And so we heard stories of campers who had faced their fears, who had the courage to keep going even when they were scared, of a, of a seven-year-old who had the courage after 45 minutes to climb up and sit on the back of a horse, an animal that he had never even seen before in real life. We heard a story of a camper who, who was a little afraid of heights and was able to get up on the high ropes course and was able to complete all those elements. And again and again, we heard stories like these and how they were made possible through the encouragement, through the support of all those fellow campers and counselors who encouraged them, who reassured them, who told them that they could do it, that they believed in them. And they enabled these campers to do these, achieve these significant milestones. When that campfire was over, when my visit was over and I was driving home, I couldn't help but think about our scripture for today. How I had just seen it brought to life before my very eyes. Children at Camp Hope learned to embrace this vision of a positive future. One that they haven't seen yet, that hasn't come to be yet, but they are asked to envision it. They're asked to believe in it, to have the courage then to also act on that belief. And then this is made possible in no small part due to the encouragement, the support of that great cloud of witnesses that surrounds them. Friends, as we read our scripture today, we are indeed inspired by these heroes of old that we read from these wonderful biblical stories. But at places like Camp Hope, we are also inspired by the heroes of youth, seven, eight, nine, ten-year-olds who have every reason to quit, every reason to give up, every reason to lose heart. But by faith, they choose to run the race with perseverance. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, may we look to Christ, holding fast to that which anchors our faith, running the race with perseverance, so that we may not grow weary, 